Good morning. Uh, today's video is called Creoles and Condillos, and it's about revolutions that happen in South America. Now, unlike the U.S. and France, the revolutions that are going to happen in Latin America, they're not caused by the intellectual components of the Enlightenment. Uh, the, the revolutionaries, they're aware of the Enlightenment, they, they know it exists, they have the idea of constitutionalism, they know a little bit about social contracts, but it's not going to greatly influence them. The most direct cause, believe it or not, is actually Napoleon. Um, a lot of these Latin American re uh, revolutionaries are going to have to choose between uh, whether they support Napoleon, whether they support the old regimes, the new regimes, or if they want complete independence. So, in other words, they just they don't want to miss their shot at getting independence. Now, the first place I want to talk about is Argentina, and it was originally known as the Viceroy of La Plata, and it included modern-day Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia. Mostly Creoles, meaning people who were of Spanish descent who were born in the colony. Uh, a couple of Native American, or Native populations, I should say, uh, and their Indians is the uh, proper term, and then slaves as well. Now, these Creoles were split between the cities of Buenos Aires and the grasslands, and the people in the grasslands supported colonialism, the people in the cities supported independence. Uh, there's also a competing claim over Uruguay uh, with Brazil, both Brazil, which was a, a, a Portuguese colony, and the Viceroy La Plata claim the land that is today Uruguay. Now, independence from Spain is declared in the year 1816, and after independence, the elite who are in Buenos Aires are going to control the government, while the uh, gauchos or cowboys of the grasslands, they're going to basically stay outside the government. Um, they didn't really care about independence. They just wanted things to keep going the way it was. Um, one revolutionary named uh, Jose de San Martin is going to actually export this revolution to upper Peru to try and help free Argentina. The idea was if they beat a Spanish force that could come in and take over again, they're more likely to keep their independence. Because of the, the competition over Uruguay, Uruguay doesn't actually get its complete independence until the year 1828 because there's some fighting there. Now, there's a constitution created in Argentina in 1853, but because of disagreements between the grasslands people and the city elite, um, there's not even going to be the effects of this constitution put into place until 1861. We have a war called the Paraguayan War that's going to involve Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. And it's really over a territorial dispute. The president of Paraguay thought that if they went to war against Brazil, that Argentina would support them because Paraguay is kind of like a, a buffer between the two countries. Well, the, the president of Paraguay thought very wrong. Uh, Paraguay is going to lose about half of its population and over a third of its territory because of this. Now, after this war is over, many of the cities in Argentina and in Latin America in general are going to start to industrialize slowly. They're going to start producing textiles. And believe it or not, the grasslands of Argentina are going to develop very much like the American West did. They have their own form of manifest destiny. Uh, there's going to be European immigration that comes into Argentina. And there's going to be the creation of these ranches and cattle. And even today, Argentina is a huge producer of beef. All right, moving on to the next place is Brazil. And Brazil was originally a colony of Portugal. And in 1807, when Portugal is invaded and taken over by Napoleon, the royal family of Portugal is going to leave and go to Brazil and make it their new kingdom. 
Now, King John the Sixth is uh, going to be forced back to Portugal. Uh, basically, the wealthy elite and the nobles say, hey, if you don't come back, we're just going to overthrow you. And so John the Sixth goes back to Portugal to rule. He does leave his son Pedro to rule in Brazil. Pedro is going to declare independence from his dad in 1822. <clears throat> now, the Brazilian monarchy is going to be based on the idea of divine right. It's going to be a... It's an absolute monarchy, or at least as close to it as you can get without being one. Pedro does create a constitution in 1823. The constitution gives him almost complete power. Um, there's a weak Senate. There's severely limited voting rights. Pedro I has permission to hire and fire basically every government minister you could think of. Now, Pedro does abdicate, and he leaves his five-year-old son in charge. And his five-year-old son becomes king, except he's too young. So there's a set of regents who are going to control the government for about the next uh, eight, nine years. And these regents create uh, provincial assemblies. The regents create provincial governments. And the regents give these provinces power over their budgets. And... Not only that, but these regions create a national guard to try and stop any revolts that may come up. Well, Pedro II, I know it says Pedro III, I have to fix that. Pedro II is going to turn 14 in 1840. And when Pedro II turns 14, um, all the reforms that those regions did go out the window and Brazil returns back to an absolute monarchy. Now, the Brazilian economy, it's very much based on the slave trade all the way until 1888. That's when slavery is going to be outlawed in Brazil. Now, the reason that slavery is outlawed has nothing to do really with Brazil. It has to do with Great Britain. After Great Britain banned slavery in the early 1800s, it started to try and pressure other places into doing the same thing. Well, by 1849... Uh, the British Royal Navy was conducting anti-slave patrols in Brazilian water. So it became harder and harder to import slaves into Brazil because of that. Eventually, by 1889, 1890, the army of Brazil, they overthrow the government because of how long it took to outlaw slavery and the fact that Brazil was increasingly isolated from the rest of the world because of the, Br the British Navy. Uh, there was also this love of French liberalism and French ideals that were cropping up, and Brazil wanted to be more like France. Now, the economy itself is based on cotton and coffee. That's both before and after slavery. Uh, there's also a group of wealthy urban elites in the cities. Uh, those who were in agriculture, they wanted revolution. They welcomed the revolution. Those who were the wealthy elites, they wanted to maintain the monarchy because the monarchy and these elites worked side by side. In 1896, coffee prices start to fall just because there are so many coffee plantations and there's overproduction. And as a result of this, Brazil is going to switch to an economy based on textiles and food processing. Today, Brazil is one of the largest food processors in the world. We got Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Uh, these three places were known as the Viceroy of New Granada, and they had the largest population of free blacks and mulattoes, um, mulatto meaning of, of mixed uh, ethnicity. These people were known as the Pardos, and they made up a little over 50% of the population. Uh, originally, the Pardos and the Creoles worked together. Um, in 1811, the Creoles are going to overthrow the government The Creoles declare independence from Spain in 1812, and it doesn't last very long because after Napoleon is defeated, the Spanish monarchy is restored. Spain comes for its colonies in 1814. So there's a war that happens, and the Viceroy of New Granada, it does not obtain its final independence until 1819, much of 
that's done by Simon Bolivar, uh, who leads a military force to defeat the Spanish. Now, Simon Bolivar, he's a really interesting person. He was born of a wealthy elite family. Um, he couldn't actually work in the government because he was born in the colony instead of in Spain, even though his family was well off and of Spanish descent. He eventually goes to Madrid, falls in love with it, marries a woman, though uh, his wife dies, he goes back to Madrid, and he's kicked out of the city, goes to Paris, falls in love with it, watches Napoleon get crowned in 1804. Uh, he used to think of Napoleon as a hero, but then Napoleon kind of tried to take over the world, and Bolivar's like, nah, this isn't my guy anymore. And then he gets inspired to lead a revolution. Uh, because of all of his work and all of his, his dedication to the independence movement, in 1822 he becomes president of the newly independent Gran Colombia. But eventually Gran Colombia is going to break up into different parts. One of those places is Venezuela. In Venezuela, uh, it's really unstable. It, it's been unstable basically since it was created. Uh, from 1830 to 1900, that 70-year period, they had more than 20, I'm sorry, it was 40 presidents and 30 revolts. And each of these presidents would take over kind of by force, and they would claim that they were going to fix things, and they would gain a lot of, of followers. They would promise change. They would take control, do just enough to get the people to support them, bring in foreign money, and then pocket all that foreign money, and then they would be deposed and killed. Uh, Colombia itself broke apart in the early 1900s, late 1800s, uh, and this actually has to do with construction of the Panama Canal. Um, there was a war that broke out between Federalist groups and government groups, and there is a revolt in modern-day Panama. Panama wants to break away from Colombia, and the United States actually gets involved. They say to these revolutionaries, if you give us control of the, Can the Panama Canal and let us build it, we'll help you with your revolution. And so revolution breaks out. The United States sends its navy down to the coast of Panama, prevent the Colombian government from stopping the revolution, and then the United States ends up being the first country to recognize Panama as independent. And then we get control of the Panama Canal until I think it was 1999. Now, the revolution in Mexico, this is the one that is most directly caused by Napoleon. Uh, when Napoleon takes over Spain, there are different factions who are going to develop and have different allegiances. Some people in Mexico are, are going to be directly loyal to King Ferdinand. Others are going to be directly loyal to the Viceroy of Mexico, who was the, the governor of Mexico. And then there's a third group who just flat out want independence. Eventually, a civil war is going to start. The civil war starts in 1813. Independence will be won in 1821. It doesn't end until there's a compromise between the rebel leader Vicente Guerrero and the royalist uh, Agustin de Iturbide. They agree Mexico should become a constitutional independent empire, and this empire is going to control uh, what is today Mexico, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Honduras, and the southwestern United States. Uh, this constitutional empire, it ends by 1822, 1823, when all of the Central American countries declare independence from Mexico. And Mexico is going to end up being a republic starting in 1824. Very shortly after it becomes a republic, American settlers are going to be invited into what is today Texas. And this is quite simply because the Mexican government needed tax money and they needed help protecting citizens from Native American raids. So the American settlers, they agree to leave their slaves at home, except they don't. Uh, they agree to become Catholic, except they don't. And they agree to pay taxes, which they don't. By 1835, the 
the Mexican government and the American settlers living in Texas are not getting along. By 1836, independence is declared, a war breaks out, and the Texans beat the Mexican government. Texas will become an independent country from 1836 to 1845. That's not by choice. Almost as soon as they were independent, they were continually trying to join and become part of the United States. And that doesn't happen until the Mexican-American War. Now, after Mexico loses the Mexican-American War, there's a lot of instability. And that doesn't end until 1876 when a guy named Porfirio Diaz leads a coup against the government. Now, Porfirio Diaz, uh, he is technically the president of the republic, but he's actually going to rule until 1911. And it's under Diaz that industrialization comes in and modern infrastructure happens. But a civil war is going to break out in 1910 because Diaz is caught manipulating the election. The opposition leader, Francisco Madero, calls on the middle class and the working class citizens to rise up against Diaz, and they do. One supporter of Madero, a guy named Pancho Villa, starts taking over plantations in northern Mexico and redistributes the wealth and the land to the peasants. Uh, Emiliano Zapata is going to defeat government troops near Mexico City, Diaz flees the country, and Madero is going to be named president. Uh, but a counter-revolution happens, again, where supporters of Diaz want to put him back into power. And just when it looks like the revolution is over, where it looks like the, the government of Madero is going to survive, a pro-Diaz force wins a battle in 1920 and declares an end to the revolution. So the counter-revolution succeeds, the actual revolution fails. This new government does give some reforms to the working and middle class, but they don't go nearly as far as what the revolutionaries wanted. Um, the middle class and the working class go along with the revolution, but they're, they're um, going to cause trouble. And off and on throughout the 20th century, Mexico had you know, some governments rise and fall, and it was not always stable there either. All right, that is it for this lecture. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you soon. Goodbye.